So, uh, <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are. Um, looking forward to this uh, next hour, um, where we're, I'll be presenting, and we also uh, have one of our alumnus that's going to be presenting, talking about the GloCal uh, Fellowship. <clears throat> sorry, sorry. Um, so I'll be giving a general overview of the uh, fellowship program, the GoCal um, uh, fellowship program, along with Zachary Madewell, who's the alumnus, I'm talking about his experience as well. So thank you, Zachary, for joining us. Um, so I'm Craig Cohen. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive sciences, and also co-director of the University of California Global Health Institute, and the principal investigator of the GoCal uh, Health Fellowship. Um, again, welcome. And so I also will be introducing the other um, PIs uh, to the program. So Jay Lee uh, is a professor <clears throat> at UCLA. And uh, I see we have Beatrice Martinez Lopez from UC Davis on. Natasha Martins, our other PI, she's from UC San Diego. She may or may not be able to join, but she's available for questions uh, afterwards, especially those of you who are linked with UC San Diego. Next slide. So the UC Global Health, uh, uh, Global Health Institute Global Health Fellowship provides an opportunity for aspiring uh, young uh, researchers, both from the US and our 17 partner countries to have an, a, to essentially spend your undivided attention on developing your research acumen and, and potential uh, during a year long mentored fellowship program. Next one. <clears throat> Next. So we are looking to, we're gonna be recruiting for our 11th year. We're now, we, our 10th year uh, fellows are in the, uh, just started the program in uh, early July. So we're gonna be recruiting for our 11th year. Uh, the history of the funding of the program, we were first funded by the Fogarty National Center at NIH in 2012. We're one of six programs, um, two of them, which are hosted by the University of California, UC Berkeley hosts the Global Health Equity Scholars Program. So far, we've had 148 fellows that have been funded uh, in the first 10 GloCal cohorts. And in some years, we've had 10 fellows. And this year, I think this is our largest year, we actually have 21 active uh, fellows in the program. So it varies a lot. Uh, depending on the amount of funding that we get from NIH and also the number of outstanding and excellent applications that we get from you. Next. <clears throat> so, uh, as I mentioned, I'm the PI along with Stephanie Strathy um, and then Natasha Martin from UC San Diego. Uh, Beatrice Martinez Lopez, who's on this call, uh, it represents UC Davis and Jay, and, uh, Jay Lee uh, from UCLA. Should also mention that we encourage participation from students and fellows from all 10 UC campuses. So even though we have four primary campuses demonstrated here, uh, if you're from one of the other six campuses, including Berkeley, uh, you are eligible to apply if you're a US citizen or resident. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we work with 17, uh, with 21 institutions in 17 countries uh, in low and middle income countries around the world. Next. Next. Okay, so the primary focus of the program is mentored research. And we expect all the fellows to uh, develop their research uh, project uh, before they start developing the, a, a research proposal uh, as they're applying. It's a required element of the application process for those of you who've taken a look at that. Um, the research, we expect the, and I'll get into the details here in a moment, but we expect people to be on the ground conducting their research for 11 of those 12 months at least. Although if you're uh, a fellow, postdoctoral fellow from a low and middle income country, we have a new element um, to spend two or three months here at the University of California, which I'll mention in just a moment. Um, mentorship is really a centerpiece. We want you to connect with established, with people who are already established as your mentors, but also to reach out and bring new uh, faculty uh, into supporting you in developing your research uh, potential. Uh, and this includes mentors. At, um, you need to have at least one mentor from 
your host country and the low income country institution, and one from your primary host institution, the University of California, it can be from your campus, does not, and then one additional uh, UC mentor as well. You may have more than that, but we're expecting everybody to have at least three mentors. We have a glo uh, global health educational component. I'll be talking more about that later. A career development element um, where, uh, the, where we actually have opportunities to put in front of you uh, leaders in global health from around the world um, to provide opportunities for you to ask questions, for them to talk about their life, their trajectories, so you can reflect on your own. And then this new element, which I'll get into briefly here, it's called enhanced training in, in the US. So this is required. So we are now competing for the next five years of funding. And part of the, the request for proposals was to include this element. The main purpose behind it was an acknowledgement that sometimes many of our fellows that were coming from LMICs did not have the same strong connections with their University of California mentors as those trainees coming from the University of California. For many of them, they had never met face-to-face, -face, may never have met face-to-face, -face, and may never even during the training program. So the main, one of the main purposes is for low- and middle-income country fellows to spend, in most cases, their first two to three months here at the University of California to really establish or start to establish those strong relationships that will really help you throughout your career. Um, in addition, we've developed it where we provide now one month of training in the advanced training in clinical research here at UCSF. So we anticipate that most LMIC fellows after there's an orientation at the NIH campus in early July, following that would then spend the next approximately four weeks here at UCSF. Um, and then after that would spend the next one to two months uh, at the UC campus where their primary UC mentor is. If it's UCSF, you will be here in San Francisco for two to three months. It's, if it's UC Davis, you then would move to Davis, which isn't very far away, or UCLA or UC San Diego, or one of the other campuses, uh, one of our other six campuses uh, throughout the state. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions around this. It's a new element. We haven't implemented it yet. And we'll be, you know, this first year is a bit of an experiment um, that we've put a lot of care and time into developing this, this part of the proposal. And we think it really will benefit um, fellows coming from low and middle income countries. Now, some of you um, on this call, for example, may have really well established relationships with your UC mentors. Some of you may have received part of your training or all of your training, doctoral training here at the University of California. And for you, this first two to three months may not make sense. And so we do have exceptions uh, where you may come at the end of your fellowship for two or three months. Perhaps you want to analyze data, write manuscripts, uh, and also work on your next grant. Uh, so this would be an opportunity for you. But this is a required element um, coming from our funder, which is the Fo uh, Fogarty International Center. Next slide. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, we have um, uh, 21 partners that we work with, and we really consider these institutions uh, in these countries partners um, in 17 countries. And I would mark, so many of the, um, as I mentioned, we're going through a competitive cycle. Uh, so we have some new partners. In South Africa, where we have been working in the last five years, our primary connection there has now moved. Uh, and so we have a new partner there. Uh, in Uganda, we have one new partner. So we now have three total partners uh, in Uganda. They're all affiliated with Macquarie University, but they all have different uh, slight bents. The new partners focus on TB and TBHIV research. Um, we have a new partnership in Thailand at Chiang Mai University uh, at, at, in Iran. Um, and then we wanted to expand our partnerships in Latin America. So we now have a new partnership in Ecuador, one new partnership in Peru, uh, and one in Bolivia. And the specifics of each of the uh, partners is on our website, so I'm not going to go through the details um, and what their main focus is and their point of contact as well, if you haven't already reached out to them. Next one. <clears throat> okay. 
So who's eligible to be a GLOCAB fellow? Um, so we are taking US citizens and residents as postdoctoral fellows. And in fact, a lot of the funding from Fogarty, they kind of tell us we want this proportion of the, of the fellows to be US postdocs. And it, that 60% of those that we accept are supposed to be US postdocs. Um, that doesn't mean we're not looking for other for advanced doctoral students from the US. And certainly, historically, about half of our trainees are postdocs from low and middle income countries. So if you come from a low and middle income country, you have to come from one of those 17 countries <clears throat> and uh, you are eligible to apply, you need to be a postdoc. Now, a postdoc could be, um, it's following the Fogarty definition. So if you have a, for example, I work a lot in Kenya, if you have a MBCHB or medical degree, you are eligible to apply as a postdoc. Um, if you have a, same thing, if you have the similar degree in pharmacy, uh, you're also eligible. Same thing for PhDs. Um, if you don't already have a, a medical or dental or pharmacy degree, then we would expect you had have your PhD or you are pretty much guaranteed to graduate by June of 2022 for this next year. Same thing for the US postdocs who are applying. We would anticipate that you already have your PhD, your MD, whatever your terminal degree is, um, not by the time of your application, but by the time you would graduate, you would be in June. So you could start the program as a postdoc in July. As I mentioned earlier, the program is open to senior professional students. Uh, and advanced doctoral students from any of the 10 US campuses. For postdocs, you don't need to come from the University of California, but you then would be transitioning into the UC system. Uh, so we've had many, many of our postdocs are not, uh, did not receive their doctoral training at the University of California, but they're opting to come into our system. Next slide. <clears throat> so, we are open to, we're very, uh, if you take a look at what uh, fellows have done in the past, and that's on our website, you can take a look by year, you'll see that is a very broad array of topics that um, uh, trainees uh, tend to pursue. So this is a photo of one of our fellows, I think from the first year, who's an oceanography student who is combing the ocean for cyanobacteria uh, and looking at new cancer therapeutics. So in Panama. I should mention. Um, and then in regards, we take people from the traditionally health sciences, uh, public health, medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, and veterinary medicine, but also we really want to encourage those of you who come from traditionally non-health centric uh, uh, disciplines, um, whatever it may be, I mean, it could be engineering, but of course your, your aim has to be to advance global health in some way, in some fashion. Next slide. So first step is the, uh, in, to the selection process to have you apply and this informational session is to give an overview of the program, the application process, and then to start to answer your questions. Uh, some of you I know already have been in email contact with Kim, who's our, the deputy director and program manager for GloCal, has been with us from the very beginning. Um, she's exceptional to say the least. Um, so in that application process, we really want to encourage you to reach out to your mentors or potential mentors as early as possible. One of the challenges that we've seen over the past few years is, for example, if you're a fellow coming from a low to middle income country, and then you're waiting to the last week to identify, or maybe last two weeks, identify your UC mentor, maybe you don't already have a connection at one of the UC campuses, that can really jeopardize your application. We try to work with you, but the sooner we can work with you, um, the better. We have a new list of mentors on the site. The, the mentor that you find or select does not necessarily have to be on that list. Any UC faculty member is eligible to be a mentor in this program. They have to opt in. You have to ask them, will you, you know, have a conversation with them, a Zoom call, whatever your process you're gonna go through. And if they're willing and, and they're willing to be a mentor, that is fine. The people on our list are people that we've vetted already, they've opted in and they should be available. If you have a problem reaching them, 
contact them. You don't hear back from them after one or two attempts. Do let us know so we can help to facilitate making that connection. We'll usually work with one of the site PIs who can then make the connection on their specific campus to reach out to that specific faculty member. Just so people know, for UC California, most campuses are starting classes this week. People are very busy ramping up to teach again. Um, and so people are busy and they get an email from somebody they don't know, you, you know the story. So we will, we're there to help you, but the sooner you let us know that we can help you, the, the better. We don't wanna be hearing from you the last week that you don't have a, a UC mentor, which is a requirement for your application. So once you've submitted your application, there's an initial review by our steering committee, which is comprised of researchers from across the UC system, as well as our low and middle income country partners. Um, there's then a panel, uh, and then that gets ranked. Um, and then we do, uh, for those, usually we end up interviewing about half of the people that apply to the program. Um, we have a panel interview, which includes the steering committee members and at least one member of our executive committee, uh, which is comprised of the PIs along with uh, one leader in global health from uh, Africa, one from Latin America, and one from Asia. We then rank those applications, and then the leadership group then decides on who will be accepted. We have um, uh, three buckets, accepted, um, wait list, and then the last bucket is uh, reject. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we really do our best to, you know, take your, and really you want to put your best effort into putting together your written application. And then eventually, if you are asked for an interview, to then practice some typical interview questions. These aren't surprise questions uh, so that you can put your best uh, feet forward. Next slide. <clears throat> So we do have some recruitment priority. For those of you who already work in HIV research, um, about 60% of our money, maybe half of our money comes targeted for HIV. So, um, and if you don't already work in HIV, but you're interested in expanding your research into HIV research. For example, um, we just got a grant with our colleagues at Kemri to look at uh, smoking cessation among people living with HIV. Um, that is now HIV research. Uh, please think about that. Of course, you want to do the research that you're really passionate about and where you see there's a real gap in the region where you're working. Uh, we also have other money that's been targeted for non-HIV mental health work. Um, and we've had uh, good success. We have separate money coming from the National Institute of Mental Health. So the NIH is comprised of 31 uh, centers and institutes, uh, sorry, institutes, centers, and offices. And the ones here um, are the ones that, are, that have uh, give, had some sort of a commitment to providing funding to this program. Most of our funding comes from, from the Fogarty International Center and the Office of AIDS Research. The ones in darker blue are the ones that are opted into this competitive cycle that are definitely gonna provide resources. The ones in lighter blue are the ones that sit on the sidelines and I won't get into the details, but as we vet the various applications, we use the funding that we have and we still have additional excellent and outstanding applicants. We make the best pitch to then uh, to these institutes through Fogarty to have additional money. And this year, we have money, I believe, from eight centers and institutes and offices across the NIH. So we did exceptionally well, meaning the, the applicants did exceptionally well this past year. Next slide. So just give you some broad examples of fellows uh, over the recent past that have been in our program. So Wan Dong, um, he was a medical student. He's now a resident um, from the UCLA uh, Drew program. He studied antibiotic resistance um, in non-pathogenic uh, bacteria in Vietnam. He's now a pediatric resident at UCLA and is very interested in continuing his, his uh, career in global health. We've been in contact with him recently. Next, Kendra Beard, a doctoral student at UC Davis, uh, looking at inflammation and nutrition around iron status, worked in Kenya. Uh, she's now a nutrition scientist at WorldFish which is based here in San Francisco and continues to work globally. Next slide. Uh, Lauren Hack uh, was a US postdoc at UCSF, um, focused on school home program for youth with attention behavioral concerns, 
working in Mexico, which unfortunately is not one of our target countries. Uh, Fogarty has excluded it from the list, but it's the G20 country. She's now an associate clinical professor uh, and attending psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry at UCSF um, and continues again to, with her global health work. Next. Hendry Sawe uh, was an international postdoc from the Muhambili University of Health and Allied Sciences in Tanzania. Uh, he's an emergency uh, care physician <clears throat> um, and did research in that field in Tanzania. He's an associate professor and head of the emergency medicine department at MUHAS. And we're also very fortunate that Hen Hendry has been very active with GLOCAL and very successful in recruiting tan young Tanzanian scientists into the program. And he's our GLOCAL site PI uh, and a steering committee member uh, from MUHAS, from Tanzania. Next. Alerza Otero, uh, international postdoc from uh, uh, Uni University of Peruiana, Caetano Heredia. I'm sure I butchered that name, sorry. Uh, in Peru, <laughs> uh, she was studying uh, prevention of tuberculosis in children. Um, she's an assistant professor at Cayetano, and she received the first K43, which is a very prestigious award, career development award, mentored scientist award uh, for international scientists in La all of Latin America. And uh, she serves on our training advisory uh, committee. <clears throat> Chemtai Mungo uh, is, uh, was a US postdoc. She was also funded on a T32 training grant. Uh, which is a very common mechanism for supporting postdoctoral and doctoral uh, programs in the US. Uh, she's originally from Kenya, uh, but uh, received her uh, college education and medical school <clears throat> and residency and all of her training here in the US, uh, mostly at UCSF, uh, has been working with Kemri uh, in Kenya, looking at uh, preventing cervical cancer among women living with HIV. Uh, she just uh, started an assistant professor position in the Department of OBGYN at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Very sorry to see her go, but also so happy uh, to celebrate her uh, advance in her career. Uh, and she was a GLOCAL fellow for, for one year, although she really expanded that over three years because she had the funding from the T32. So if any of you are supported on T32, we do sometimes look for situations where we can identify co-funding that allows us to fund more of you. So if a T32 will cover salary, the GLOCAL can cover all the additional aspects of the program uh, as well. Next slide. Next. <clears throat> so as I've mentioned earlier, mentorship is really the cornerstone of the, of the program. You want to, uh, and I always, I teach mentorship to mentors and mentorship ideally is a mentor driven process. It works best when you select your mentors and you find where there's a good fit rather than when you're assigned mentors. Um, we do uh, expect everyone to have three mentors when they apply. Um, <clears throat> one member has to be from one of the four campuses. Uh, one mentor has to be from the international, your international sites. Uh, and then we look for a trans mentor. This could be somebody from uh, any UC campus, we occasionally have had mentors come from other, other institutions where there's been a longstanding um, collaboration or mentorship from an individual uh, as well. It could be another mentor from your international site or from another UC campus or the same UC campus, whatever is best for you. Oftentimes it may not be specifically in your specific discipline. We're really, really asking you to stretch. We want you to think about interdisciplinary research so you need to bring those various disciplines into your mentorship team. Next slide. <clears throat> and we have expectations for the mentors. Uh, we have the mentors and the trainees sign a compact, which we hold them to. How often are they gonna meet? What are the goals of the mentorship uh, for the year? Um, and then how, yeah, how are you gonna meet? And are you gonna meet in person? Are you gonna meet via Zoom um, in, other, in other ways as well? Um, next slide. <clears throat> So tips for success, like you're probably all asking, you know, how can you, well, first of all, you have to submit the application by, by close of business on, uh, I believe it's a Monday, November 1st. So that's first. And we do not have extensions in our application process. Some of the other consortia do, we do not extend. Um, so you need to get things in, uh, all the essential elements in, and, and I won't go over those details. We have put up examples. We have a checklist. And we also have examples of successful applications for you to look at. 
I think one real key after all these years is work with your mentors early and often to put together the strongest application possible. Don't come to them last minute and expect to get a lot of detailed input. We want your ideas to float to the top, but you need to put in the time and effort to put together the strongest application possible. <clears throat> and that means if you're coming from the US, you may not have any experience working in the international site. You need to work with those individuals or whoever's gonna be your lead mentor there as early as possible to number one, ensure you get the support you need. And number two, ensure that whatever it is you're proposing is really meeting a local gap in <clears throat> advancing global health, whatever that gap may be. It can't just be an idea that you've hatched from the US. You have to see if there's a real need within that country, within that region. Next slide. Okay, so uh, we're very fortunate that the, we all like each other, all the six consortia, all the PIs and the program managers, we get together also with our program officer uh, from the Fogarty. Um, we collaborate on many different elements. So I mentioned earlier, there's an, there's an orientation on the NIH campus. It's usually the first or second week of July. It's, it's really one of my favorite weeks. Over the past two years due to the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, these orientations have been virtual. We'll have to wait and see. We're hoping that we can have it uh, in person uh, this next July. But either way, there'll be a week-long orientation um, and the last, even the last two on uh, the virtual ones were ex extremely uh, successful and really um, <clears throat> well appreciated by the trainees. We also provide opportunities for, for professional networking uh, at the orientation and meeting with um, program officers, uh, directors, including directors of institutes. Uh, remember you, part of doing global health research and being funded by the NIH is developing those relationships early and having them be strong as well. So we help you uh, through that process too. Uh, we hope to be able to restart uh, developing regional workshops. Of course, this depends on the pandemic if, uh, and travel restrictions and if it's okay to get people in a room together. Uh, once again, uh, we also collaborate on various publications and presentations at the Consortium for Universities and Global Health. Uh, we have a panel every year. Uh, we publish a special issue on mentoring in low and middle income countries, the American Journal of Tropical Medicine. Uh, we've collaborated on various supplements, like a mentorship supplement, and sharing of resources between the programs. <clears throat> Next slide. So November 1st, don't submit your applications on November 2nd. Um, the GoCal website, I imagine most of you, if not all of you have spent time on the website. And Kimberly is outstanding, <laughs> knows the program better than anyone, including myself. And she's available uh, uh, to answer your questions. And if she can't answer your question directly, she'll know who can. And then to also, if you're working on coming from a specific campus like UCLA, San Diego or Davis, please reach out to the PI on your campus as well. And then as you can also reach out to me, if you're from UCSF, reach out to, to me. If you're from any other campus, reach out to me as well. Uh, I can also help. So uh, Kimberly is kind of like the cornerstone, uh, this, the main stone, but please reach out to the rest of us too. <clears throat> okay. So instead of taking questions right now, um, I think we'll go ahead with Zachary and Zachary's presentation. <laughs> yes. Sounds good, thanks. Um, so let me share my screen. Can you guys see this? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, um, hi, I'm Zach, and today I'm gonna to be talking about my GloCal Fellowship in Guatemala. Uh, I was there in 2018 and 2019. First, just a little about myself. I'm originally from Sacramento and have a bachelor's degree in computer science from UC Santa Barbara. And I was able to study abroad for a year at the University of Queensland in Australia. And this piqued my interest in international work. So I applied to the Peace Corps, and ended up in a rural township in South Africa for two and a half years. And that piqued my interest in epidemiology, so I applied to an MPH, but I had six months to kill. And so I taught English as a foreign language in China before coming back to California to start an MPH. 
And I, as an MPH student, I was able to do an internship in Brazil uh, for my master's thesis. After graduating with an MPH, I did Peace Corps response in Kingston, Jamaica, uh, before coming back to San Diego to start a PhD program. And um, as a PhD student, I was able to participate in an internship in San Juan, Puerto Rico for my dissertation research. And then I was a, a GLOCAL fellow in Guatemala. And after graduating with PhD, I was a postdoc at the University of Florida, and I'm now with the CDC in Atlanta. So I was a GLOCAL fellow in Guatemala City. Guatemala is in Central America and borders Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, and Belize. Guatemala has a lot of arboviruses like dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. And I was interested in doing arboviral research as an epidemiology PhD student. And so I came up with this project with the help of my mentors, my UC and, and host country mentor, using ovitraps for 80 species control and arboviral surveillance. And so I was at the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala. But when I arrived in Guatemala, my mentor was really nowhere to be found. And I was just kind of on my own in Guatemala City. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know anybody. Um, but I was interested in arboviruses. And you know, I wanted to have a good GLOCAL fellowship. And, and I needed to satisfy the um, requirements for my PhD dis dissertation. So I took the initiative to reach out to investigators from just every organization that uh, was present in Guatemala, including USAID and CDC and others. And this um, drive ultimately led to um, eight first author publications. And I'll very briefly uh, discuss these. The first four are about arboviruses and their vectors. And so in this study, we found that households that cooked with firewood were less likely to have a dengue, chikungunya, or Zika virus infection than households that cooked with um, electricity or gas. <clears throat> in this study, we found that households that were closer to roads in other houses had more uh, mosquito larvae and pupae than households that were further away. This was kind of a perspective piece about arboviruses and their vectors. And I took a bunch of photos of Guatemala. This is the central palace in zone one. This is a weird Eiffel Tower in zone nine, I think. The markets were really cool in Guatemala City. Of course, the landscape and the volcanoes were awesome. This is in Antigua. This is Lake Atilan. And as a GLOCAL fellow, I was also able to um, participate kind of in an externship to uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, where I worked with investigators at the, the Dengue branch and GLOCAL covered the costs for my travel to Puerto Rico. <clears throat> and this ultimately led to another manuscript where we used modeling to compare vector and human surveillance strategies to detect local Zika virus transmission. Here's some photos of Puerto Rico. This is old San Juan. In those manuscripts, I was ultimately able to use to satisfy part of my dissertation requirement for the UC San Diego PhD in public health. And the other projects weren't, or were more um, had to do with knowledge attitudes and practices of seasonal influenza vaccination. This wasn't for my dissertation, but were just other projects that uh, presented themselves while I was in Guatemala. And so one, one of them was of postpartum women in Honduras. Uh, we looked at older adults in nursing homes and daycare centers, uh, healthcare workers in Honduras, and also healthcare workers in Costa Rica. As a GLOCAL fellow, I was able to attend the um, APHA meeting in Philadelphia, and I had three oral presentations, including uh, two, which were um, my GLOCAL projects. And, and GLOCAL covered the um, costs associated with travel to Philadelphia. I was also able to um, take Spanish language classes in Antigua, and this was really useful. Um, we had these one-on-one -on -one language lessons with um, a, a local speaker, uh, and it was really, really useful. After GLOCAL, uh, I was a 
graduate teaching assistant as I tried to finish up my dissertation. And then I traveled across the country at the start of the pandemic to the Emerging Pathogens Institute with the University of Florida to do a postdoc. And now I'm with the CDC. So I'll kind of briefly talk about my, my recent um, work. So I was in Gainesville this last year, um, the land of the gators, and I was with the Emerging Pathogens Institute. And here I mostly worked on using modeling to help um, guide vaccine trial design. So that was a couple of studies I worked on. I also worked on a systematic review and meta-analysis of household transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so we published this in 2020 and then did a, a recent update. I'm now at the CDC where I'm with the Prevention Effectiveness Fellowship in the brand new infectious disease modeling track. And here I'm actually working with the Child Health and Mortality Prevention Surveillance Network, uh, CHAMPS in the Center for Global Health. And CHAMPS has sites in um, eight, uh, seven countries, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also South Asia. And they're bringing it on an eighth country in um, India. So let, some lessons learned in GloCal. Harmonious interactions with your mentors, peers, and administrators, definitely integral for success. You have to boldly take initiatives to get things done and pay attention to details. It's best not to have too many assumptions, prejudgments, or expectations. And it's good to have a plan B if your initial project falls through. And I, I took a bunch of photos. This is uh, Antigua. This was actually um, a, a slum, a um, Colonia Limonada, which was only a couple miles from my apartment. It's the largest slum in Central America. And it was, it was crazy. This is Lake, <clears throat> Lake Atitlan. This was a Hobbit themed restaurant near Antigua. This is actually colored sawdust. And I, did, I wasn't sure what this was used for until I saw this one day, which was a, um, a carpet of intricately placed sawdust, which they use for religious processions. This was actually El Tunco Beach in El Salvador, which was a four hour bus ride from Guatemala City. This is a volcanic crater in El Salvador. Here's Ronald in a quiet oasis in Antigua. So yeah. Carpe diem, it's a little cliche, but there are a lot of opportunities out there and you know, you could really have a successful fellowship if, if you seek them out. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. Um, so I think now we're the next uh, 20 minutes that we have, it's really to answer your questions. And I think if you could use the reactions and just raise your hand, um, then we can, and then you can speak your question. So this is your chance. Anybody have a question? <laughs> Don't, you can't be shy. This is really, we, we, I'd rather have, yeah, if you have a question, I'm sure half the people here probably have the same question or similar question. You can also type your questions into the chat if you would like. Oh, there's a hand raised. Brianna? Okay, Brianna. Well, um, everybody, thank you for um, providing us some information regarding this program. Um, my question is actually directed towards Zachary, and I just wanted to get a sense of what the process was like coming up with your research proposal going into the GLOCAL Fellowship and how much there was cohesion between what you were anticipating to do and whether there was any changes in what you actually did in the fellowship in the field. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I had I was really interested in doing arboviral research as an epidemiology student, and so I worked closely with my mentor from UC San Diego to come up with a project. And she put me in touch with 
all the researchers she knew at my host country um, site and um, just kind of like said, go ahead and peruse their publications and, you know, figure out which uh, investigator looks the best. And, and so the person I, I selected had um, or, uh, publications on malaria and other arboviruses. And so I thought, you know, this would be perfect. Um, and so I reached out to her and together we kind of came up with a project and I had difficulties just kind of like getting some information at first from her. And I wasn't sure, you know, like I had Skype issues and it just seemed like a lot of issues. And, and you know, my UC mentor and my trans mentor both said, you know, Zach, once you get on the ground in the country, you'll be able to work all those details out. And, and so I, like that, that was not super, you know, I, I wanted to have everything figured out before I went, but you know, global health, that's not always the case. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I ended up going to, you know, arriving in the country and I, I saw my, my host country mentor a few times in the first few weeks. And then she kind of like mostly disappeared and um, she was out of the country. And so I um, reached out to basically anybody I knew who had pretty much ever been to Guatemala and, and asked, asked around and just, just started um, trying to identify different projects in, in arboviruses. So I, I think my case is probably different than, than most people. Um, you know, my initial project, I really had to, you know, make a lot of changes to it. Um, but ultimately, the projects that I used for my dissertation and my GLOCAL fellowship were within the what I initially proposed, you know? So I don't know, yeah, if that's helpful or not. Let, let me let me just respond. So Zach obviously, you know, had a, an amazing GLOCAL uh, year and then obviously continuing to really advance his career. What Zach experienced in Guatemala is not our ideal. And in fact, you probably saw that Guatemala is not one of our host countries anymore. Um, <laughs> in part because of Zach's experience. So we really have worked hard. I'll just explain, we just went through a competitive cycle for the grant. Uh, we had all existing sites had to reapply, even those that have been you know, fantastic for, ten, for all 10 years. Um, but, and then we also had an opportunity for new sites to apply. We really wanted to make sure that sites opt in and that really requires the commitment of the site PI as well as a, a group of mentors at that institution. So I'm not saying what has happened to Zach is completely unique, but it's not our ideal. And obviously Zach turned it around and turned it into you know, a really uh, important exper experiential year for him, um, but it's not our ideal. So you shouldn't shoot for that. You should really work as early as possible with your mentors from UC and your host uh, institution in the country. Uh, to put forward with what you expect to do during the year. Now, I should also mention, we didn't talk about it, we haven't talked about COVID-19 very much, but last the this year, all the fellows are, are either in their country if they're, um, or on their way in the next week or so. Um, last year though, uh, we had most of the fellows, uh, so the international fellows started because they were home the U.S. fellows had to delay um, their programs by three, six, or sometimes even by a full year uh, because of the pandemic. Um, now, other fellows were on the ground during that period of time. Many of them built COVID-19 into their research. So if Zach would have been a fellow a year later, he would have been incorporating COVID-19 into his research in Guatemala. Uh, and we've had many successful examples of people who've answered really relevant local questions um, from a whole broad array. Uh, and some people decided to repatriate immediately after the, the emergence of the pandemic. Many decided to stay, it was their own choice, and to incorporate COVID-19. So we certainly want fellows to be, I think Zach demonstrated a lot of um, adaptability. So we want fellows to be adaptive because you know the next Zika or COVID could be around the corner and you might be in the right place at the right time to help answer important questions. So we certainly encourage that with, uh, within the program. So we have some questions in the chat now. Okay, um, open it up. Okay. Uh, From Moses first. 
Okay, yeah. Um, is it a full time which program? Is it? Okay, yeah. Uh, so, Moses, yes, we expect you to be a, if you're a Glowcap fellow, we expect it to be full time. Um, now, you can have some, if you're a clinician, I don't know if you're a clinician or not. Uh, we do allow some small amount of time if you want to continue clinical work or clinical teaching, but otherwise we expect you to be a fellow for uh, full time. Um, so for the international mentor, uh, you're from Uganda. I assume your international mentor is not the Ugandan mentor. I assume you have somebody in Uganda, but yes, you would need to identify your primary University of California mentor from one of the four campuses. Um, you know, you can look at the mentor list and reach out to people. You should be doing that today or tomorrow uh, based on your research area of interest. Um, and if, again, if you need some help, um, we are here to help you do that, but we want you to do it as early as possible and let us know if you have any problems. Um, your project is not HIV or mental health. As I mentioned earlier, we, the broader your area of interest, we like. If you're an oceanography student, which you're probably not from Uganda, you're eligible as long as you have a global health outcome. Um, I don't know what your discipline is, but we, as long as you're focused on some global health outcome, you can be an engineer, you could be a lawyer, you could be whatever, uh, you're eligible to apply. Um, and there's, you know, Uganda has been one of our real star countries. There's many, uh, the, the site PIs, I don't know which, you know, would you go through IDRC, IDI, or our new collaboration on the TBHIV, depending on your area of interest, you should reach out to that site PI early and they can help you work through this. They've, Uganda's literally been one of our top three, four countries uh, throughout the 10 years of the program. Um, okay, and then explain more detail about two, three months in the UC. Uh, yeah, so um, again, we wrote this in the proposal. We haven't implemented it yet. So the way that it will work is after the orientation at NIH, uh, we would expect the LMIC fellows to come here to UCSF for one month. If you want to look up something on the research course, also known as DCR at UCSF, it's a one month, um, uh, which is pretty intensive. <clears throat> you're not just with your fellows, you're with postdocs from across uh, UCSF. Um, so it's an opportunity to connect with other trainees here at UCSF. And then after that, the next one to two months, so the full two to three months, you then would be based at the primary um, location of your UC, primary UC mentor. So if it's UCSF, you would stay here. If it's LA, you go to LA, San Diego, Davis. It could be one of the other UC campuses as well. Um, and during this period of time, we'll be having both during the first month here in San Francisco, we'll be having in-person meetings. And for the rest of the time, we'll be hybrid, uh, uh, virtual and in-person because you will expect people to be across the state. Um, and we'll be having mentorship meetings, works in progress meetings. We're still developing the specifics of the curriculum, but a lot of the time you'll be working with one-on-one -on -one with your mentor or, and, or within her or his lab group or clinical research group, depending on the situation. Um, now for Brianna, yeah, so we do, you know, I, I don't know, you're not specifying if you're a, are you a doctoral student or, yeah, okay. So we do prioritize postdocs, but we have uh, doctoral students in the program. So you should apply, uh, especially if you're an advanced doctoral student um, and talk with your primary supervisor and mentors and see if the program, if this is the right time for you. Um, but we have a number of doctoral students uh, in the program and you just heard Zach present as well. It's kind of where the funding from Fogarty, they say we went mainly US postdocs. I think they're what they're looking at return on investment, a quicker return on investment. And so we, we have to some degree follow them, but we've been able to get um, professional students like medical students in particular, and then uh, doctoral, advanced doctoral students into the program as well. Um, and then for Daniel, <clears throat> yep, 
Yeah, so sorry, I should have included that. Thanks, Daniel. So if you are a lab-based scientist or translational scientist, during that two to three month period, you would be here at the University of California. We would anticipate you would, you know, again, you would be within your mentor's lab group. We would anticipate you would be uh, working in the laboratory and learning techniques which you would need to conduct your research. So certainly that's very much part of the tech transfer. Um, and from Kenya, uh, Moses Madadi, uh, who's now a professor and head of department, um, did just that. He worked in, uh, <clears throat> in a laboratory here on placentology. There's very few labs that focus on the placenta. So he worked with Susan Fisher, one of the world's experts on that. And then afterwards got another fellowship, continued to go back and forth between uh, Kenya and here. And as his GloCal year was able to conduct some really groundbreaking research, and uh, he just is in the process of getting a very um, uh, big award from an unknown foundation. So yes, please, um, you certainly, we want you to talk with your mentor. This is a new element of the program. If you're lab-based or translational based and you think working in the lab during this, this two to three month period of time, you might err more in working, being here for three months, make the argument that you need the full three months in order to develop those laboratory skills uh, that you need to conduct your research. For Sherry, <clears throat> Yeah, so, you know, Fogarty wants us to have it, they, and we fight against this with them, don't, this is private, <laughs> um, but usually, traditionally, we've had about half the fellows be U.S. and half be from low and middle income country partners. Um, they're trying to push us more towards like a 60-40 split. Um, so it, it also depends on the applications we get for the year and uh, who submits. We really advocate for funding whoever has the fund whoever has the strongest applications uh, funding those individuals but there is pre some pressure from Fogarty just full disclosure towards leaning towards the U.S. trainees but again um, you know I don't know if you're LMIC or if you're U.S. again the main thing <laughs> is to if you're interested in applying is put together your strongest application possible and we're and working as early with your mentors is really key to your success, including if you're coming from the US, you wanna work with your the LMIC mentor. Uh, in the LMIC, you wanna identify your UC mentors as well. Uh, let's see, Bob. Uh, Bob, that's up to you. I mean, certainly that's a strategy that many people before you have taken um, would be to have an ancillary. So Bob is a, is a research coordinator for an ongoing collaboration between ID uh, Infectious Disease Research Center in Uganda with UCSF. He's asking, does it make sense to develop an ancillary project on that um, yeah, ancillary to the much larger NIH funded research project? Um, Probably, but if you have another interest that's like a burning desire in your heart that's not central to um, that research project, then maybe you should branch out. So if, it, if you think you can get the research done within this larger collaboration, have the buy-in from the PIs, that's probably the easiest route. Um, but if you have some other burning desire to go in another direction, then you should follow that passion because you will become the strongest research in the areas which you're passionate in. Any other questions? We have just a few minutes left. <clears throat> These are great questions, by the way. So um, I didn't mention what you get <laughs> if you're successful. So we cover a stipend. We pay what up to the NIH allowable amount for US mentors and for our LMIC, sorry, for the US trainees. And for the LMIC, it's a negotiated rate with each institution has their postdoc rates. Uh, so you get your salary covered. Um, we cover 15, up $15,000 for research expenses, which is really unique for many fellowships. Many fellowships cover travel and stipend, but don't give you money to do the research. They force you to apply for additional funding. So we give you $15,000, which we found has been sufficient. And this is to cover staff time, lab reagents, 
uh, other supplies, maybe local travel, whatever it is that's required for you to conduct your research. Um, we also provide travel again to the NIH for orientation, uh, travel to conferences. Zach mentioned, I mean, he used that resource very well uh, during his year. Um, and you, some of the money gets, can get extent pushed into the few months afterwards as well, if you need that to present results of your research. Um, and then we also provide money. We ex expect everybody, um, all the fellows to take some on, usually in most cases it's online courses. So we give you some resources to be able to do that as well. We have some other bells and whistles in there, but those are the primary elements. So it's a well-funded program and you're part of a growing network. Again, we now have 148 uh, fellows and or graduates of the program. And, and Roger Glass, who's the director of the Fogarty, really holds this program at, in really high regard. So the publication costs will come out of your research costs. That's a good question, Daniel. Um, <clears throat> so you need to budget accordingly. You may have other resources to cover publication costs as well. Uh, oh, let's see, Marcella, okay. Um, You, uh, either way, Marcella, you would have to sell that what you're proposing to do is different than what you're already doing or the next step. Uh, certainly, if you have preliminary data from something or from a first step and you want to apply, um, that would be a great strategy. <clears throat> okay. So we're at the top of the hour. Again, um, I think we're going to say goodbye. If We really encourage you to apply. Um, again, you have a about six weeks left to get your applications together. Uh, if you have any questions, you can start with Kimberly or start with your mentor. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or if you're particularly connected with UCSF or think you should be. And then um, uh, the other site PIs, uh, Jay Lee, uh, Natasha <coughs> Martinez Lopez, and uh, Natasha, sorry, Beatrice Martinez Lopez and Natasha Martin, UC San Diego, are available as well, um, as well as the, your the site PIs uh, in our partner countries. All right, well, nice meeting you virtually. Um, look forward to reviewing your applications when they come in, and um, have a good rest of your day or evening. Bye. Thanks, Kim.